Welcome. This episode covers the development of my patio's architectural drawings based on the requirements and design of my patio model shown in part one of my patio series. This is the second episode in my six-part series for patio construction. This episode will show you how to produce plans for your patio that will meet your county's permit requirements and enable you to pass your building inspections efficiently. As a potential patio builder and owner, you have five viable options for completing this effort. You can use them individually or use them in combinations with the other options shown here. You can perform all the work yourself as the contractor. You have the option of subcontracting some of the tough construction tasks to the experts like I did. After studying parts one through six of my series, you can use this information for developing questions, to interview your potential contractors for your patio work, and show this series to your potential contractors to define your requirements. You could ask your contractor to review parts one through six and ask him or her to design and construct a variation that matches your home and meets your requirements. Lastly, you can use my six patio episodes for monitoring your contractor to keep him and his construction crew honest. In this episode, I'll cover the importance of good architectural plans, explain the significance of my lot plan, rear and side elevations, and detail A. Talk about the footing, column, and beam plans, certified trusses and their locations, and the Simpson connectors and their locations. We'll then finish up by addressing the optional Simpson connectors I added to maximize the strength of the structure. I had two years of mechanical drawing in high school, so I was very familiar with developing the detailed drawings required for a county building permit. This high school experience also enabled me to validate mechanical drawing at West Point, so I was very familiar with developing blueprints. My older brother, who is a licensed civil engineer in Colorado, was also familiar with developing architectural drawings. I wanted a good set of detailed plans approved by our county engineer for my building permit that I could strictly follow during construction to ensure that I easily passed all building inspections. If you don't have county oversight, you probably live in a municipality that requires a similar approval. I also live in a subdivision that requires trustee approval prior to starting construction. So I obtained my county approval of the plans prior to submitting them to my subdivision trustees to make it very difficult for them to disapprove the plans. These plans also ensured that I didn't have to do any rework or purchase any additional construction material. During construction, I strictly followed my blueprints and easily pass all of my building inspections. Consequently, I recommend that you consider the same approach. In addition, there are some other improvements my older brother, the civil engineer, incorporated into my design that I would have not included if I put together the drawings by myself. I will cover these as we progress through this series of patio episodes. Most counties require lot plans for residential building permits. Shown in red is the addition of my patio. I understand that residential structures have limits as to the percentage of their lots that they can consume. Consequently, this plan makes it very easy for the county to determine if you're exceeding this percentage. Most of you are most likely very familiar with front, rear, and side elevations of a home. Nevertheless, I would like to point out some important points of these elevations of my patio. This is the uh, rear elevation of my home. It shows exactly how the patio design impacts the existing structure of the house. It also includes the rooftop of my existing home, which was not included in my part one model. Most importantly, it shows the overall design of the patio to include its roof and arch lines here. In addition, it shows the following key features of my patio design. Six by six treated columns with decorative aluminum wraps, which match the columns on the front of my house. Footings, which are also included in several other drawings. Additional concrete for the enlarged portion of the patio. The front arch, dotted lines outlining the scissor trusses with 712 pitches on the top and 3.5-12 on the bottom. 
this beam consisting of three 2x10s and half inch plywood, a Cricket Valley roof line which I will build in part four's initial construction and framing, a vent above the center of the large arch, and the removal of this window which the county building inspector later allowed me to cut in half rather than install this brand new one. This is the side elevation of the patio structure showing its changes to the existing design of the house from a side perspective. It shows these four columns, uh, their aluminum wraps and several Simpson ties. Later in this episode I will explain in detail what these Simpson ties are and why they are important. This is the roof line of the new patio from the side elevation and its overall impact on my home's appearance. In addition, it shows this gradual downward slope of the patio concrete and pier tops to ensure that all water flows away from my house and foundation. This is detail A within my drawing package. Starting from the bottom and going up, it covers the following details. The footings, their dimensions, and additional concrete, the Simpson column base, the 6x6 columns wrapped with decorative aluminum covers, aluminum column bases and column caps, a Simpson quarter bracket, and this beam which consists of three 2x10s with the addition of half inch plywood to help carry the load of the roof structure. It also features the aluminum soffiting, fascia and siding that covers the front trusses, the actual trusses themselves, and the plywood roofing, shingles, guttering, and drip edge. This is my footing plan. It shows my eight pier footings, their locations and measurements from the house, and their distances from each other. Part three shows how I dug the holes for these footings, poured the piers, and installed the columns above the piers. This shows the existing concrete, my existing stairs, and the new concrete that I added under the enlarged patio roof. It is very important that you keep these footings aligned and perpendicular to the house to ensure your beams and columns are perfectly parallel and perpendicular to the house. This in turn ensures that your trusses fit perfectly over the beams. Distances A and B have to be exactly the same and distances C and D must be the same. Very similar to the footing plan is the column and beam plan. It shows the positioning of the columns over each of the eight tiers and calls for attaching the load carrying beams to the tops of the columns. The plan illustrates how I bolted the patio's left beam to this wall of the house with 5 8 inch lag bolts. It also shows that I connected the right beam to the house with a Simpson post cap and Simpson angle attached to a 4 by 6 vertical post that I embedded within the wall of the kitchen in the back of the house. In addition, the plan specifies that I built all of the beams with three 2x10s and one half inch plywood so their widths were identical to the 6x6 columns. It also shows that the columns consist of treated 6x6 posts with Simpson column bases embedded in the tops of the concrete piers. My part three pier and column installation episode shows how I did this. This is the first of three construction areas that I subcontracted out. I purchased my trusses from a reputable truss company that delivered them to my driveway in one load. This was the first page of my truss plan which I included within my drawing package to the county for my building permit. As required, the truss designs were developed and certified by a registered engineer who was licensed in my state. I have civil and aerospace engineering degrees, but I'm not licensed in the state where I currently live. Nonetheless, I recommend that you similarly buy your trusses from a trust company with a licensed engineer on their staff. Please note that the trust documents, which I included within my drawing package for my building permit, were a lot more detailed than this. They included all the trust load specifications, dimensions, and other technical information. I paid approximately $1,900 for these trusses, which included nine large and two small scissor trusses and one large and one small gable truss. Bottom line is, this proved to be a very good investment. The small T01GE gable truss and the front side of the large T02GE gable truss are located here and the two small T01 scissor trusses are installed here. The rear side of the T02GE gable truss on the front of the patio is shown here. 
These are four of the nine large TO2 scissor trusses. Prior to starting this project, I never heard of Simpson connectors. Earlier in this episode, I mentioned that I worked on a frame carpentry crew during one of my summer breaks from school. At that time, we did not use them, and I don't think Simpson connectors existed or were well known. If I designed this patio by myself, without my brother's expertise, I would have erroneously failed to include these valuable connectors. Consequently, the strength and integrity of the structure would have been significantly degraded. I most likely would have done a lot of rework and encountered some problems with my building permit. With this said, if you are serious about building a similar structure, I strongly recommend that you review the SimpsonStrongTie.com website. It provides numerous building connector improvements that significantly improve the strength of structures. If you live in a potential earthquake, hurricane, tornado, or high wind area, this website is a must. Simpson's seismic ties and straps are critical for these areas. The five types of Simpson connectors that I used are shown as follows. This is the Simpson column base that I bolted to all of my columns and submerged within the top sections of my eight concrete piers. And these are the Simpson post caps that connected the tops of my columns to the beams. This is the Simpson header hanger that I used to connect the right patio beam to the 4x6 column that I embedded in the back wall of my kitchen. These are the rigid corner brackets that I used to reinforce the attachments of all the columns to their beams. This is a Simpson post cap. As an option, I added these Simpson angle and T-braces that I had to special order. When the building inspector saw these, he commented that my structure was overbuilt and the patio was more likely to withstand a tornado while our house perished. Consequently, I met my goal of designing and building an incredibly durable structure. This concludes the architectural drawing portion of this project. At this time, I'm moving on to part three of my patio series, showing how I installed my piers and columns. You're more than welcome to follow. In addition, if you have a great project that you want to post on my YouTube channel, email me some pictures and a brief description of it. If it qualifies for the Let's Fix It Right standards to help others, I'll interview you over the phone as a guest do-it-yourselfer, produce a high-quality video, and post it on my Let's Fix It Right channel. For the year following this posting, I'll share 50% of the potential YouTube benefits with you. If you have any subject matter requests or recommendations, please contact me. All of this said, I recommend that you subscribe to my channel, follow my projects, and save a bundle of money doing it.